Hi, Dory. Hey, Claire. Great to connect. So good to meet you. I've kind of been like one of your, you know, stalker fangirls from afar. I totally loved um, Stand Out. And look, so you even I, have a prop. That's I amazing. Do, I do. Thank the, you. The prop, right? In case, in case you don't have it. Um, so I'm super excited to chat. Um, I'm just gonna kind of read your your bio before we get started, just for folks who you know don't already know and love you. Dory Clark is an adjunct professor of adjunct, adjunct, I said that wrong. Dory Clark is an adjunct professor of business administration at Duke University's Fuqua School of Business and the author of Reinventing You and Stand Out, which was named the number one leadership book of 2015 by Inc. Magazine, one of the top 10 business books of the year by Forbes, and was a Washington Post bestseller. A former presidential campaign spokeswoman, the New York Times described her as an expert at self-reinvention and helping others make changes in their lives. She is a frequent contributor to the Harvard Business Review, Time, and Entrepreneur. Recognized as a branding expert by the Associated Press, Inc., and Fortune, Clark is a marketing strategy consultant and speaker for clients, including Google, Microsoft, Yale, Fidelity, the U.S. State Department, and the World Bank. And she is here talking to me in my home office today. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, so I'm just so excited to, to chat. And I guess more than anything, I would just love to kind of hear a little bit kind of of, of your story in the beginning of, of how you got to be, you know, Dory Clark sitting in, in New York City with a, is that a like a sculpture on the wall behind you? It is. It's a big three-dimensional sculpture. And uh, occasionally when I'm doing an interview or a webinar, the real excitement, you, you know, we, we have to give like viewers a reason to stay tuned. Uh, occasionally, the excitement is that my cats will decide to climb it. So you, oh you might see them hanging from it. <laughs> it's not a good idea. That's and I advise risky. them against it. They yes. Are wow. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're risk taking guys, I gotta say. <laughs> okay, so tell me about about you. Who are you, Dory Clark? Well, uh, the, the, the origin story is that I grew up in a small golf town in North Carolina and, um, I, my parents decided this would be an ideal place to, uh, to raise a child. I disagreed rather vehemently uh, with that. And so rebelled by not becoming a golfer and trying to leave as quickly as I humanly could. So I, uh, I went to, to college early. That was my, that was my escape plan. And, uh, I ever, ever since then have been, you know, just kind of, I, on, uh, a winding trajectory because the things that I was most interested in doing didn't have a clear career path and I wasn't sure how to accomplish them. So I had to just make a bunch of educated guesses, um, many of which crumbled because of the digital revolution. Uh, so I started out trying to be a journalist and then got laid off and I wanted to be an academic and then I didn't get into any doctoral programs. And, wah, wah. You know, uh, so sad. Uh, but you know, you had, you had to improvise. And the good news is that I, uh, I, I have been able to find a, a pretty exciting path. So, um, I took the pieces that I had in place. I was a, I was a political journalist for a while. I was a spokesperson on political campaigns. So I, I, uh, ran press for a, uh, for a presidential campaign, for a gubernatorial campaign, you know, consulted on many, many races for about a decade. Um, I ran a nonprofit, a bicycling advocacy nonprofit for a few years. I made a documentary film and I took all of that in a bag and shook it up. And, uh, and for the last decade or so have had a career writing business books, speaking about them, doing some teaching, uh, consulting, coaching, et cetera. And, uh, and that's that whole suite of activities of being able to live with ideas and help people. Uh, so that's, that's what I'm doing now. I love it. Um, and I think something that is interesting kind of about your story is this idea of, you know, taking all these disparate parts of you and shaking them up, as you say, and then sort of coming out the other end as an expert in a particular area. And one of the things you you talk about in Stand Out, your latest book, is this idea that um, – you are an expert, not you, Dory Clark, but you, the reader, are an expert, right? And I think that sometimes we don't think we are or or think we can be. And you share the story of Rachel Ray. And obviously, people think of, you know, Rachel Ray as this, I mean, mega star, which she is today. But basically that, you know, the idea behind the story you share is that Rachel Ray wasn't that way. She was basically a home cook on like a small, you know, network or, you know, small little cable channel doing some cooking demonstrations, essentially, who got – 
you know, picked up and seen as an expert all of a sudden. And you have this quote where you say, you know, your expertise doesn't have to include the most prestigious dis- diplomas or accolades. Sometimes you just have to know how to do something different in a given context and do it well. And um, I don't know, can you just talk to me about this idea that, you know, maybe more of us are experts than we than we are, realize? Yeah. They, and I'm glad you brought up that example, because I think it is rather emblematic. I mean, so in the early days of the Food Network, the people, you know, rather logically, that were the big stars in the Food Network, the first people that they tapped to have shows, were people who had the credentials. You know, they, they, it was famous restaurateurs, or it was people who had gone to, you know, Le Cordon Bleu, or you know, these mm-hmm. these very uh, prestigious culinary academies. And so Rachel Ray, when she looked at that, she didn't have those credentials at all. She didn't have a restaurant. She'd never been to culinary school. She had taught herself how to cook and was literally like where she got her start was doing 30 minute cooking demos at a chain of supermarkets in like Uh, upper New York state. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, not glamorous at all. And she was kind of astonished why uh, TV producers would be would be interested in her. She she didn't she didn't compare in any way to the credentialed experts. And she she said to them during her her meeting that that she had with them, you know, you've got the wrong girl. I, you know, I, I do not fit this mold. And they said, no, no, no. That's exactly why we want you. And I think that that's a really important lesson for people to take in that, you know, yes, the, the sort of logical, the easy the easy path, uh, you know, to say, OK, you can make it big in this field is by having the same credentials as everyone else. And, you know, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. That's the well-trod path. But it's mm-hmm. also a very difficult one because there's a ton of competition. Everyone knows that's the path. And in order to succeed, you have to be better than whatever, 10,000, 100,000, a million people. You have to be the best. But you can actually sometimes accomplish the very same thing and get just as far, if not farther, simply by playing a different game. And the game that she was able to play was being the opposite of that because the Food mm-hmm. Channel uh, executives, they, they realized in looking at their suite of offerings that everyday cooks would look at Emeril Lagasse or they'd look at Mario Batali and say, well, it's awesome that they can do that but I don't own a restaurant. I never went to culinary school. Can I actually, you know, cook this dish? But if they looked at Rachel Ray, they'd say, oh my God, if she can do it, I can do it. And she was relatable. And for that reason, because she was completely different, because she was completely herself, they realized they had something special. She, she was, you know, they were the apples, she was the orange. And by going with that, she was able to succeed. And I think fewer people think that that is possible than, you know, really is the case. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, and just thinking back on this idea of, you know, playing a different game, I think so many of us, we don't, yeah, we just think we have to do the thing that other people have done, but we're going to do it worse. And that ultimately doesn't, yeah, it doesn't get us maybe where we want to be. That's super interesting. Um, So what about, what about this idea that, you know, you, you talk about in standout, um, that sometimes we don't necessarily know what our big idea is going to be, right? And so this is, you know, part of part of the book is basically walking us through how to find that breakout idea, right? And so you say, you know, sometimes you have to experiment with a lot of ideas and see which one sticks. If you're unsure, let the market decide. So I want to ask you about this idea, but I kind of want to ask it in the framework of, you know, a lot of us these days have heard this idea that, you know, we need to kind of winnow down to not be overwhelmed by choices. And so how do we how do we, you know, throw a bunch of spaghetti on the wall to figure out what idea is going to stick at the same time as we don't become totally overwhelmed by, you know, trying to be an expert in absolutely everything? Right. Yeah, that that is the central paradox. You're exactly right. I think that the way that we prevent ourselves from being overwhelmed is by almost consciously holding ourselves back at first from hmm. going all in. And what I what I mean by that is that, every, you know, in, in you know, this is a philosophy from from Silicon Valley that I think is now, thankfully, um, sort of, you know, getting out into the rest of the world. But if you if, you know, one of one of the case studies, one of the people I talk about in uh, standout is, is Eric Reese, who wrote, you know, famously the book, The Lean Startup. And they talk about a concept called the, the minimum viable product. And the idea there is that 
if you, you know, whether you are creating a software company, whether you're creating anything, if you just go too far down the garden path without any kind of validation, without talking to customers, without talking to people, just because, you know, oh, this is going to be so amazing. And you invest all this time and all this energy in it. And, you know, we all know people like this, you know, that, that, that have this idea that they've been cooking up for years and they don't tell anyone because someone might steal someone their might steal idea. <laughs> <laughs> but they've they got to, you know, release it. But they know <sighs> that when they do release it after you know, decades of tinkering and making it perfect, it's going to hit so big. Well, you know, almost always, of course, it never does because they haven't talked to anyone. They haven't, you know, seen if other people like that. They're just in the echo chamber of their own head and it bears no resemblance to reality. Meanwhile, the, you know, the opposite approach is that if you're, if you're testing a few small hypotheses, in really tiny ways. If, you know, I mean, in my case, personally, I, you know, I'm not creating products, but I'm, you know, I'm creating ideas, right? I, I write, I speak, I teach. And so for me, the example of sort of a minimum viable product is like a blog post. Like, hmm. is, is it, is it worthy to create a book about something? Well, hmm. you know what? Book is not going to sell if even a blog post that I write about it, nobody's interested in, like, you know, that's, that's a pretty minimum threshold. Like if is somebody willing to spend five minutes reading an 800 word article, if they are not, they are not going to read <laughs> my book. So just having, having those little kind of tests is so important. And I think people overlook it because it's fun as a human to just, you know, go all in and get excited. And, oh my God, I have this big idea, but it creates a kind of, a kind of mania and a kind of solipsism that is not helpful at all. Hmm. Hmm. That's really interesting and so, so, so true, right? I mean, I think a lot of times, sometimes the reason we want to um, just stay in our heads with that big idea is because we almost don't even want to do the work. And so it's easier to just stay in our heads in some ways. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's sort of genres of uh, procrastinators, you know, there, there's right. – there's, yeah, it's like, you know, when you when you see people that really desperately want to be successful but aren't for some reason, you sort of look at what they're doing and and one oh. type, one variety oh. is the person that keeps researching things. And they get so excited about the research and, oh, I, I need to buy this course and I need to buy that course and, and then I'll be ready. Right. And, and, and it just, it keeps coming and, and they want to, they keep learning so much, but they never do it. And it's, uh -huh. you know, and I think in some ways that's a really, it's, it's almost, I'm not sure if it's the most insidious, but it's one of the most insidious forms of procrastination because they're not technically wasting their time right they're learning they're right. doing something productive so right. it feels productive it's not like they're like you know fucking around on facebook right. or something right. you know but nonetheless it's the illusion of productivity because nothing ever happens that's i mean that's fascinating and I, I do think that's one of my traps in life in general but i guess this isn't a therapy session for claire um <laughs> so okay talk to me about research because in standout you you know you basically say if you have this idea you if you know you figure out your idea you know you need research and i think you know you developed the ideas for the book through articles you wrote in harvard business review and in other places but you know not everyone feels that they have the ability to do research on that level perhaps so what can research mean for um someone who's who's not dory clark i guess <laughs> well, okay. The first thing I want to, uh, so, so yes. And the first thing I just want to do is rebut things because I lived in Boston for 17 years. And the first thing that you learn when you live in Boston, where like everyone has a Harvard affiliation <laughs> is that a Harvard affiliation is like, really, it's like the most boring <laughs> thing in the world. It's like, you, you know, people far away, like you're in Argentina. And so like the farther away people are from Harvard, the more it's like, Oh, Harvard. But the closer you are to Harvard, it's like, who cares? <laughs> Who doesn't? Blah. Like not not oh, exciting at funny. all. That's so funny. I think I think the world overblows it that's because funny. of the brand. Uh, but but the exciting learning from that is that if you are actually able to swaddle yourself in social proof, you can get so far just because people are like overly impressed sometimes with brands. So, you know, people might think, oh, it's hard to write for the Harvard Business Review or something. And I mean, it's hard in the way that writing for anything is hard because yes, you have to learn the editorial voice. You have to, you know, sort of learn how they want you to present 
uh, information, but that's not substantively different from doing anything else for anybody else. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Uh, But number two, I would say that, um, you know, everyone can and should do research of some form. And what I mean by that is that the easy thing to do, the easy way out is, and, and, you know, it's a starting place for a lot of people, but they say, okay, I need to, I need to create content. I need to blog or do whatever. And they just, they just come up with like their opinions, like, you know, oh, here's, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah happened with United Airlines. Let me write what my opinion is. Boom, boom, boom. And, you know, the truth is until, I mean, you know, this is just a fact of life literally for, for all of us. Until you rise to a lever, level of stature where people have already heard of you and they're like already sort of waiting with with bated breath, no one cares what you think. I mean, I, like I would care what Oprah thinks because I would care what Oprah thinks about anything because Oprah's just like really interesting. But she spent 30 years earning the right mm-hmm. for me to care about like mm-hmm. what soda Oprah drinks or what she mm-hmm. thinks of United Airlines. Mm-hmm. Uh, for for literally almost everyone else, no one cares what your opinion is. They want they want something real and meaty and substantive. Now, research though can take many forms. It could take the form of you interviewing someone who's a genuine, a, you know, respected and externally acknowledged expert. That's a form of interesting research. It could take the form of you looking up uh, studies. And I don't mean you have to be an academic to do it or whatever. I mean, like you can do a Google search and, you know, I mean, you just have to be smart and not whatever, quote Wikipedia and, you know, random, you know, fake news sites from Belarus, you know, you just, you know, you need to like look at, at what is coming out of, of journals that are being cited, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's not that hard to do. You could do, um, you know, depending on the topic you could do, uh, you could create your own survey of, you know, various people or clients. You could write a case study about something Mm -hmm. that you have intimate experience with. I mean, maybe you're a consultant and you've worked with a company. You could write a very in-depth uh, case study about all the steps that you took and what you know what the problems were. If you're able to create something that is just more in-depth and than the norm, something that's more interesting than the norm because it has more of a factual basis. It's not just like here's what I think, but it it you know it's drawing on experiences or knowledge or studies that other people have done that have real heft and merit to them, that's actually giving people something of value. And because the vast majority of people don't bother to do that, yours will persist while others fade away. Hmm. Hmm. That's awesome. So then what about once you have research, how do you move into sort of what a, what a framework is? and how you kind of build a framework around you. And you use, in, in your book, you use one of the examples of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who has the you know framework for basically grief and how we, the stages of grief that we go through afterwards, which, I mean, has been very influential in my own life on, a, on another topic. Um, but so how do we kind of, how do we make a framework? Where do you start? Yeah, so, you know, the, the first thing to mention, um, in writing Standout, I tried to come up with, uh, with pathways that people could use to develop breakthrough ideas. And so not everyone has to develop a framework. You know, it's not, it's not sort of a mandatory thing where, you know, you do this and you do this and then you have to have a framework. Um, it's, it's one of the possible options on the smorgasbord. Um, so that's, that's the, the first piece to, to get out there that it's not mandatory for everyone, but mm. it is one of the, one of the possibilities in terms of, you know, if you are coming up with an idea that gets noticed, that gets heard, a framework is actually a really good thing to, if you, if you can develop it. Um, what I mean by a framework in general is in whatever field you are in, um, there, uh, there are usually implicit rules that are guiding behavior. And sometimes those implicit rules or, or ways of doing business have been made explicit. Um, but it's, it's because somebody has set it down and thought about it at a 30 foot, you know, 30,000 foot level and said, Hey, wait a minute, there seems to be a pattern in how these things are happening. Let me articulate it. So Elizabeth Kubler Ross says, you know what? There seem, you know, people seem to be responding to grief in similar ways. So let's let's map that out. Or you know, Abraham Maslow uh, is you know one of the other uh, scholars that I cite and stand out. I mean. Clearly, it does not take a rocket scientist to understand that if you are starving, if you're literally like starving and dying of thirst, you're not really going to be focusing so much on what is my life purpose Mm -hmm. because you need to eat and drink first. That Mm -hmm. is much more important. Mm -hmm. We all know that. Mm -hmm. But 
he was able to put it in a framework, you know, the hierarchy of needs that expressed very clearly and succinctly, okay, you get your physical needs taken care of, then your emotional needs. Oh, then, then and only then can you really focus on like the metaphysical needs of your life. And he, he was able to encapsulate it so well and so quickly and nicely that whenever anyone talks about those you know, concepts related to it, they mention Maslow and his name persists. Now, what it means for you and me is you know, sometimes it takes a while for us to be able to see the pattern, to see the forest for the trees. I mean, for instance, um, so I, I first wrote my, my very first blog post about the concept of how do you become a thought leader? How do you become a recognized expert? In 2010, this is now, as we're filming this, this is seven years ago. I've been thinking about this idea for a long time. The first one, you know, it wasn't that great. It was okay. You know, it was not like, you know, groundbreaking in any way. Um, but, you know, it was okay. I was starting to chew on these topics. Five years after that, in 2015, I published my book, Stand Out, on that topic. Um, last year, I, I developed a course called Recognized Expert, you know, going even deeper. You know, it's like 30 plus hours of video mm. content on this topic. Mm. And literally, it was only as I was developing the course, so six years into it, after I had written my book, mm. that I realized, oh, wait, there's actually a framework here that I've, di oh. that I've discovered. And you know, in standout, I had what I'll call a provisional framework, which is, you know, I talked about, okay, there's five kind of, kind of key ways you can develop a breakthrough idea. There's a three-step process to spreading the idea, blah, blah, blah. I had those things. But at its core, like, you know, if we talk about frameworks as this is the ultimate in stripping things away to reveal the simplicity on the far side of complexity, if we're talking about that, it was only in developing the course that I actually realized, oh, when it comes to becoming a recognized expert, there are just three things. I, I, I revealed this in a Harvard Business Review uh, piece earlier this year. There's three things, three key components to becoming a recognized expert. This is what it takes at its core. It's content creation. It's social proof. It's network. You have mm. to have those three things. Why do they fit together? You need content creation because if you do not share your ideas, no one will ever know what they are. They can't judge if you're an expert if they don't know what your ideas are. They can't judge. Judge. Love that word, by the way. <laughs> That's right. Number two, you need social proof because you need to give people a reason to take you seriously. You need to give people a reason to listen to you in the first place to see if your ideas are good. And number three, you need your network in order to to spread your ideas. You need a network to be able to say, Claire, this one's a good one. Oh, this one's a bad one. Here, you know, focus here. And then once they, they get excited about it too, they become your ambassadors and your evangelists. That's what makes it happen. Um, if you have those three ingredients in line, you can become a recognized expert. That's what you have to, to work toward. But it was only after years of kind of, you know, working on it, chewing on it, that I was able to to distill it down that way. So now using that sort of last key principle there, talk to me about networking and what a network is and why loose ties matter. I mean, this whole idea of sort of needing a network to help build your movement is something that is is very um is very prominent and stand out. And you have this quote where you say, you know, on building movement, you say, finally, it's about connecting those followers with one another, magnifying the power of your idea and ensuring that it's talked about even when you're not in the room, that's when you built a movement. So how do you, how do you get there and how does a network relate to a movement? Yeah, so, so building the, the network is, is really important. I mean, one of the things that I discovered is that oftentimes when you have somebody that, has hit a wall. They're frustrated. They feel like I have been trying to get recognized as an expert in my field for a long time and it's not happening, just not working for me. Off, almost always, uh, I came to realize as a result of kind of having the light bulb turn on about this framework, the problem is that they've usually been over indexing in, in one, usually one, but sometimes two of those areas, but not in the third. And this is very much a case mm. where you can't afford to just play to your strengths. You have to be good at all three. Mm. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And so, for instance, you could have someone 
let's, you know, let's have a, a case study here. You could have someone who's blogging constantly in their, con- you know, or, or doing podcasts or whatever their medium is or creating content like a maniac. They might even have good social proof. Let's say they're a professor at a university or something like that. You know, they're putting out their ideas, et cetera, et cetera. No one's listening. Why are they not listening? Well, probably it's because they have, you know, maybe they're like an ivory tower academic, you know, our, our you know, little uh, case study person. And they don't, you know, they're nervous, they're shy, they don't like connecting with people. And so no one hears their ideas. They're, they're just, they're just talking into the void. Because if you're, you know, if you're putting stuff out on your own blog, or even on LinkedIn, it, it's, it's hard for people to just randomly discover that hmm. you need to have a network. Because if, if you're building that, then you have people, you know, Claire's tw- tweeting it and I'm putting it on Facebook and I'm sharing it and I'm doing a podcast interview and I'm talking about this professor friend's ideas. And then more people are introduced to it and they say, oh, I've got to check out this guy's work. And you're able to to get uh, to get the the traction and the momentum behind it. But you need that network of other people to push it. You can't do that on your own. So how do you begin to, to develop it? Well, I think you know, there's a lot of ways, fortunately. I mean, sometimes people feel frustrated and alienated in our internet age. But I mean, one really good example, we were talking just before, uh, you know, we turned on the camera, you, you are in Argentina right now. It is probably not the easiest thing, I'm assuming, to be networking with people in the American business context, sure. if you are all the way in South America, but by doing things like this, where you are reaching out, you're having video interviews and Skype calls with people, you're able to, uh, you know, to be building this, these connections and, uh, and, you know, in, by doing it in the form of, of a summit or something like that, you're giving people a, a reason uh, you know, sort of an extra reason to do mm-hmm. it rather than just like, Hey, let's randomly connect. Mm-hmm. And so it rises to the top of the priority list. There are so many ways that people could, could be doing that and thinking about it. I'm, I'm a huge fan. I advocate for people, uh, interviewing other people. It's a great, mm-hmm. it's a great way to learn. It's a great way to connect. It gives them a reason to do it, but far too few people actually follow that strategy. I mean, that sounds absolutely amazing. Um, you know, so, okay, just to kind of close up, where where else can people sort of find you on on the internet these days? Yeah, thank you so much, Claire. Well, I would uh, I would encourage people to uh, to go to my website. It's doryclark.com. I have more than four hundred free articles on my website uh, that I've written over the over the last uh, many years, and I also have a, a free resource available online, um, which is my for people who are interested in coming out uh, with their own breakthrough ideas. It's the, it's this 42 page self-assessment that I've created a standout self-assessment. You can get it all for free at my website at doryclark.com. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you for, for re- writing a standout. I totally, totally loved it. And I can't wait for entrepreneur to you. And thank you, Dory. This was awesome. I appreciate it. It's awesome to connect with you, Claire. Thanks. Thanks.